For our text tonight, I'd like to go to the sixth chapter of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 11. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 11. And he called the twelve to him and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper uh, in their money belts, uh, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust uh, under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Here, of course, you have the Lord Jesus sending out during his ministry the apostles, those special envoys, those special ambassadors. He's sending them out, and this is very important, two by two. This can be done, obviously, it's done here with people, uh, but with also with words and with ideas. One word can be used, I'm telling you, uh, with uh, more than one meaning or used in more than one way. But often that needs to be understood in its meaning and its application. I'm going to share with you six of those connections tonight. And uh, hopefully it will help us in our maturing and understanding of uh, certain very important principles. First of all, let's look at worries and concerns. In Matthew chapter 6, and of course this is the Sermon on the Mount, in a rather long extensive passage about the, the last part of chapter 6, you have the Lord telling us not to worry, especially in verse 25, 28, and 34. He makes that strong point. You, you don't, I don't want you worrying as my disciples. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 41, when he visits the home of Mary and Martha, you remember Martha is uh, excited about the visit and she's uh, sort of off uh, center as far as uh, what is the most important thing. And, and the Lord reminds her of that and he rebukes Martha uh, for worrying. And the word that's found there is the same one that you find in uh, Matthew chapter 6. But the same Greek word, the same Greek word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 25. And let me go over there and let's look at that because it is used in a totally different sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 25. And it's talking here about the, the comparison of the church with the body and the parts of the body, the members, if you will, of the body. And, and the passage says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Care. And that's the word, the same word that's used over with, with the Lord condemning worry. So there's something happening with that same word, care. Can you have that care for your brethren without that worry that the Lord's condemning? Yes, of course you can. Another passage, again, from one of the Corinthian letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, is uh, uh, along the same line. But you notice that here is the Apostle Paul doing this very thing. Verse uh, uh, 28 of uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Beside the other, other things, what comes upon me daily, the deep concern for all the churches. Notice in the New King James, the deep concern that I have for those churches. And of course, Paul established many churches. He was concerned about many, many others. And he's saying, I have a deep abiding concern for those brethren in all of those congregations. So again, same word, but, but obviously used in a positive sense. He's not worrying in the sense that the Lord was condemning him, but uh, he has that abiding concern for them. In the book of Philippians, you have both of these, uh, are, uh, the same word, but used in uh, the two different ways. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. And uh, Paul says here, 
I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He's talking about his dear, dear Conrad Timothy. And he's saying, nobody cares about you like he does. Well, again, it's the very same word, but of course in a different context. Then turn just a couple of chapters over, chapter 4 and verse 6, and uh, here's what he says later on. But be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let, let your request be made known to God. So same word, but a different context. And the point then, and a very important point for us, you can have concern. You can have serious, deep concerns about things and not violate what the Lord said, not slip into the realm of worry, uh, but have that. And I know many of us have, have those concerned about, con concerns about one another, about our brethren, about people out there in the world, about uh, maybe relatives. It, you can have a whole gamut of people that, that we would be de deeply concerned about. But it doesn't have to slip over to the line into this that, that, that the Lord is condemning and saying, don't do that. So there's a balance. It's not always clear to us in the application of it, but it's there, and we need to understand that. And don't, don't let anyone somehow mix this up and, and say to you when you have those deep concerns, oh, you, you can't worry about that. That's, that's wrong for you to worry about that. There's a difference. And mature people would know the difference between them. Number two, there are what I call burdens and burdens. Now, what do we mean by that? In the King James Version, at Galatians chapter 2, you find this language. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You bear one another's burdens. But then you keep reading down through the passage and you come to verse 5. For each one shall bear his own burden, the King James Version says there. My new King James says load, and we'll uh, see that helps us a bit with what we're uh, talking about with this point. Now, which one is it? Do I bear my own burden, or do I have someone bear, helping me bear my burden? See, what, how, do, how do you deal with that? Well, there are two completely different words in this passage for, for burden. The first one is baros, uh, and it is a word that means a huge load, a, a, an overload, if you will, when you're, you're just carrying something that you're staggering under. Sometimes we need help with those kind of burdens, don't we? Sometimes we need someone to just get under that burden with us and share that with us, and, and we, we uh, uh, can move forward. On the other hand, the, with the 6-5, there is the word portion, portion. Well, that doesn't sound like anything like baras, does it? And it's not. But it refers to a normal burden. It would be like a backpack that our young people uh, carry to school every day. I mean, it's something you, you know you're responsible for, you're, you're supposed to carry, you should carry, you're responsible to carry it. So there's a difference. And that difference is important. And of course, I would join with you, I'm sure, in saying that we need many times Christian wisdom to distinguish between those two. We have our responsibility to carry our own burdens in life. And yet there are times, especially among the people of God that love one another, where we have brethren that just have an overload. And they need our shoulder. They need our hands to help them carry that load for a while. That's what we're talking about here with burdens and burdens. Number two, three. Let's talk about temptations and tests. There is a word group used 59 different times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used of temptation. Other times the very same word is used of testing. And of course, uh, we can figure out which one, wh the way it's used, how it's used, by the context. And we'll see some of those in just a moment. Now, it's very easy to see the, the difference in the two. Tempting is to bring you to sin. Tempting is something that, that wants you to move into evil. Testing is for our strength to enable us to be greater and more mature in our faith. And, and, and to have, our, have stronger spirits and, and hearts to do God's will. 
So it's a positive thing. So those are very easy to, to distinguish. And they will be over and over again in the text of the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verse 13, the very beginning of that wonderful book of Mark. It says that the Lord was tempted by Satan 40 days. You know, we have an example of three of the temptations, if you think about it. Three. But this says he was tempted 40 days. Oh, and apparently over and over again. Any way that Satan could uh, work his wiles and, and do his de- evil tempting. 40 days of that out in the, the desert. James chapter 1 and verse 14 says that one is tempted by his own evil desires. Have those evil desires and sure enough, there's the temptation connected with them and you have some problems. You have some, some difficulties in the testing process. The King James Version at Genesis chapter 22.1 says God tempted Abraham. If you're reading the King James, you run, turn over there and you will find that. God tempted Abraham. Actually, that's not what's going on there because James chapter 1 verse 13 says God tempts no one. So you, you can't have a contradiction in the Bible period, but you don't have a contradiction here. It's not talking about the God of the universe, the perfect, holy, sinless God trying to tempt Abraham to sin. No, the word here should be test. He tested his faith. He tested his obedience. And of course, the man came through with flying colors. Uh, look at uh, Hebrews uh, eleven seventeen with this in mind because it clearly makes this point of what was going on there. In, uh, uh, in Hebrews eleven seventeen, by faith... Abraham, when he was tested, tested, uh, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his own begotten son. So here we are, the, the, the Lord God tested the faith of this great man Abraham, and uh, of course he uh, stood the test. James chapter 1 is a wonderful passage about what, our, what the testing does to us. And, and turn over there with me if you have your Bible and, and let's read uh, 2 and 3 of the very beginning of James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now that trials is the word that we either translate tri- uh, test or temptation. Here it's t- uh, translated trials. Knowing that the testing, there's our word, testing of your faith produces patience. So, so again, we may not immediately rejoice with, with those tests that come our way. But James is challenging us to have that kind of attitude and that spirit because at the end of that, we end up with that patience. And that patience is one of the great, great words of the New Testament. It, it, it's, it, it's that perseverance that that is under a huge weight and and it it moves under that and eventually comes out of it victorious and uh again that's a wonderful word for us as as christians uh in uh, second corinthians 13 5 uh you have uh, uh the apostle paul saying this to the uh, to to the people there second corinthians 13 5 Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, uh, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So put yourself to the test. Use that marker of God's word to test your relationship to him. Number four. Again, there is one word in the New Testament that can be condemned and on the other hand, commanded. Condemned on one hand, but commanded on another. And uh, uh, in the context of its use, in other words, the, the material within the verse or the preceding verses or the, the subsequent verses will explain to us what the, uh, what, what the use is. But it's used 114 times. Now, the Lord contemns certain judgments. Matthew chapter 7 Verses 1 through 5 are probably the most famous uh, of those passages. In fact, I would imagine that this is one of the most famous passages in the Bible. People can be so ignorant of the text of God's word, but they know this passage. 
They know it because it seems like it can be used by people who do not want to think about really what the Word of God says and respond to it in obedience. But rather, when anyone challenges their lifestyle, their way of doing and, and believing, uh, the, the charge is made immediately, you're judging me. Judge not that you be not judged. And that usually stops all the conversation because that's just sort of the, the mantra. That's the, that's the key thing that is supposed to kill all discussion about really what the Word of God says. It shouldn't. It should be dealt with. But again, the Lord condemns some kind of judgments. I would encourage you later to, to turn over to that passage and study it and study the kind of judgment that the Lord is condemning there. And it's different from what we will see in a few moments that is indeed uh, important for us to do. He actually, that is the Lord, encourages other kind of judgment. Let me, let me go over to Luke chapter 12, verse 57. And here you find the Lord uh, encouraging some people he's dealing with to, um, uh, to do some judging. Chapter, chapter 12, verse 57. Yes, and why? Even of you yourselves, do you not judge what is right? He's questioning it. Why don't you make judgments about what is right? In fact, in John chapter 7, verse 24, the Lord in his wisdom gives in, in that one verse things not to judge and things to judge. Again, from John chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance. Unfortunately, in our rather superficial culture, we do a lot of that, don't we? Somebody looks nice, dressed well, pretty, handsome, nice car, nice clothes, whatever. Appearance. We make a lot of judgments, many times critical judgments, about friendships or future friendships or future appreciation of people judging very quickly by appearances that are so shallow as to the nature of an individual, the character, even the personality of a person. And so the, uh, the challenge would certainly be, be here with that. But he's not finished. Do not judge according to appearance, but, all right, Lord, is all judgment out? But judge with righteous judgment or the right kind of judgment. Not on mere appearance, but thinking about what is right. What is, what is the, the just, fair, righteous thing that we're talking about. And uh, that's the kind of judgment that would be, we would be responsible for. In Acts 16, there is a fascinating passage that I, that I think many times we overlook. In the, that famous conversion of the first uh, European convert, uh, her name was Lydia. After her conversion, she does something very interesting, especially in the context of what we're talking about here. At verse 15, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me, there it is, there's our word, you make a judgment, she says, about me. I, I beg you to make that judgment. Well, that doesn't sound like judging is, is off limits, is it? All and every time. No. What do you want, Lydia? If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. She was a woman apparently with a nice house, and she had an open door, shall we say, to these ministers of the gospel to come and stay with her. They do not have holiday inns uh, in the first century world. Uh, and this would be an ideal thing for them while they were in Philippi. And so she begged them to come to them if they judge her faithful to the Lord. So there's a place for judgment. Now, again, we need to understand the differences in those. And again, I encourage you to go to Matthew 7 for, for the difference. Number five, <clears throat> there is a difference between the leader, if you want to underline that, the leader and the leaders. Jesus called himself the good shepherd in one of the great images and figures of speech we have in scripture about the Lord. I, I certainly would think that, that uh, the Lord would be uh, uh, thinking of himself 
comparing himself to the wonderful passage in the Old Testament at, at Psalm 23 about the Lord being a shepherd, our shepherd. But then here he calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, and uh, that's clear in John 10, 11, 14, and 16. I'm the good shepherd. And he explains about what the, what the good shepherd would actually do for the flock or for the sheep. Later, that same word group, and, and the Greek word is poimen, that means shepherd, as the Lord used the word shepherd, and also means pastor. Now, the word pastor in our religious world is totally, totally different than what you have in the New Testament church. Uh, a pastor was a shepherd, was a poimen. And uh, we have pastors in the early church as leaders in the local churches. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 has Paul talking to elders of, uh, uh, of Ephesus, and he says to them, shepherd the church of God. That's another way of saying pastor the church of God, see. And then Ephesians 4, verse 11, some of those that are part of the maturing of, of, the, of the church are, are pastors. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, uh, the, again, the writer there, Peter says, shepherd the flock of God, pastor the church of church, the flock of God, serving as overseers. And of course, that's the, uh, th that word can be also translated bishop. Bishop is an overseer. So here the shepherds are shepherding uh, the flock, a local church somewhere. But then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, and let me go over there for a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, you have an interesting use of this uh, shepherd again. Uh, remember the Lord was the good shepherd in John. Now he's described uh, this way in 1, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 4. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. And it's talking about the earthly shepherds in a congregation. But being examples to the flock. And when the, Lord, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now here is, uh, in, in my translation, I think in most it has the expression chief shepherd. Well, it's actually a, a word made up of two words. Uh, 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 one word made up of two. The first part of it is the word ark, as in ruler. Like a monarch is one ruler like a king. But the word ark is before the word for poiment. So it is the chief or the leading or the authoritative uh, uh, shepherd. Uh, you might say the shepherd of shepherds, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so um, he is the absolute leader of his people. He's the head of the body. He's the husband of the wife. He's the chief shepherd of the flock. But we need leaders in local churches. We need shepherds, our poymen, our pastors in the Lord's church in, uh, in, on this earth. Leadership is absolutely essential. And so we have the ultimate leader and then leaders of local congregations. And qualifications are given, of course, for those men in, in Titus and First, uh, first, Peter, uh, first uh, Timothy. Finally, I want to talk about crosses. My cross and his cross. His cross and your cross. In John chapter 19, verse 17, it says that Jesus went bearing his cross. The Lord had his cross to bear. But before his death, he earlier challenged his potential disciples to make up, take up, I'm sorry, take up their own crosses and follow him. So what I'm saying is, as I've looked at the record in the Gospels, so he told them to do the cross bearing before he did his. And I have a whole list of references in the places where he said, do that. And by the way, you have a preacher that repeats himself. You have two of these references in Luke, two of them in Matthew. I'm proud to join that great, great hall of fame of people that uh, repeated themselves. Uh, Jesus did, and that's good enough for me. But he talked about this as being so important, taking up our crosses and following him. Why did he give that command to them before he took up his cross? I don't know the answer to that. You notice I've said in the outline why. I don't know. Could it be that he made that so clear to them, indicated this is what it will be like. But then 
Later on, he showed them that he was willing to do the very same thing he called upon them to do. He truly took up his cross to follow, to follow uh, his destiny. He bore his cross and we must bear ours. One last passage I want to go to that talks about this whole issue of crucifixion. One of the most challenging I think you'll find in scripture. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is the apostle Paul and uh, he is telling us what that crucifixion of the Lord, that his taking up of the cross meant. 220. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So crucified with Christ, my cross and his cross coming together so that we could be saved. As we close, let me remind you that even the word save can be used in two senses. Did you realize that you can be saved tonight? You can have the forgiveness of your sins tonight before you leave. All of your past sins washed away. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. But then there is a sense in which surely in a sense that we beyond this life are saved eternally. So there is a two-part, a two-way use of that. Saved now from our sins and we walk in the light and we continue to be saved. And then saved beyond this life in another existence, saved forever and ever to be with our Lord and Savior uh, throughout all existence. But are you ready to make that commitment tonight if you're not saved and right with the Lord before you leave this place? We give you the opportunity. Do you believe in him, as, uh, Jesus, as the Son of God? Are you willing to turn your life around? It's called repentance in the New Testament. Confess your faith, and we can baptize you in the water behind me for the remission of your sins. If you need to respond tonight, won't you please, while together we stand and sing.